OK, good morning. Nice way to start. So today we're going to finish talking about sorting. This will be our the plan is that this will be our last full lecture talking about sorting algorithms. We want to finish up merge sort today. And then we're going to talk about a final sorting algorithm called quick sort. Quick sort solves some problems with merge sort, but introduces some problems and some trade-offs of its own. All right, so I am not going to do any review from quiz eight today. Um, I will, uh, I might post some of the questions on the forum later today. The two programming questions should be available on, on the, the homework 125 review, set of review questions. Okay. So at this point, we've talked about insertion sort, which was an on squared algorithm. Um, you guys have looked at selection sort last time we started talking about merge sort on Friday, which is an algorithm that we, we hope it's going to achieve optimal performance. Um, today, we will continue by talking about, uh, well, we're not going to talk about heap sort, but you guys can look this up if you want to. That's interesting. Uh, today, we'll talk about quick sort, with it, which is another algorithm that can achieve best case sort performance, but again, comes with its own set of interesting trade offs. Um, and then, you know, there are other sorting variants that I would encourage you to look into if you need to sort something and you have forgotten how to do some of these. I mean, insertion sort's pretty easy to learn, um, but if, you know, you're, you're stuck on a desert island and you need to sort some stuff using a computer, uh, bubble sort will get the job done. Uh, its performance is pretty awful, though. Um, and then, as we pointed out, there are even more sophisticated algorithms that are still being developed today to solve this problem, like Tim's sort, which is uh, not that old. So, you know, here's a little snapshot from the Wikipedia page, and, and I, have, I have omitted a bunch of these. There's something called intro sort, cube sort, shell sort. Um, this is a problem that has received smooth sort. That sounds interesting. Um, this is a problem that has received a lot of attention. And so, you can certainly spend uh, while away your hours over Thanksgiving if you're bored and you don't want to watch football, um, learning about all these different sorting algorithms and their relative performance. So, our building block for merge sort was merge. So merging was the process of taking two sorted arrays of any size and merging them together. What is the performance of our merge? What's its runtime? Time complexity of actually doing the merge. So I have two arrays, and I want to merge them together. I know they're already sorted. O n. I look at the first two from each array. I pick the smaller one if I'm a sorting in ascending order, and I just repeat that process n times until I've drained both of the values from both arrays. The other nice thing about this is that there is no variance based on the input. Worst case performance, O n. Best case performance, O n. Average case performance, O n. So that's one of the things we're going to appreciate about merge sort when we're done, is that its behavior and its performance is extremely consistent. All right, so how do we turn this into a sorting algorithm? So we have this nice primitive, which is that I can merge any two arrays in O n time, where n is the sum of the size of the two arrays. So that's nice. How do I turn this into a sorting algorithm? So there, what we were going to do is we were going to apply this new technique of actually doing recursion on arrays. So if I take this big array and I break it into two smaller pieces, for ima imagine I look at the first four elements of this eight element array, I can take that array, break it down into smaller pieces as well, and pretty soon I'm left with an array with one element, which is a great starting point because, for a sorting algorithm, because what is true about an array with one element? It's already sorted. So now, by breaking the problem into these smaller pieces, I've identified a good starting point for my merge sort algorithm, which is, if I take two arrays of size one and merge them together, I'll end up with a sorted array of size two. And then over here, I'm doing the same thing, where I'm breaking this one down into smaller pieces, and eventually, that's going to create a sorted array of size two. I'm going to do the same thing over here on the right side. I'm breaking this problem down into smaller and smaller pieces, and pretty soon, I'm going to go from having eight one element arrays that are all sorted by construction into four two element arrays that are sorted. And then I can take those four two element arrays and combine them into two four element arrays that are sorted. And finally, I can take those two four element arrays 
combine them together into one completely sorted array, which is where I started. And this is very similar to what we did with lists. It's very similar to what we did with trees. We break the problem down into smaller and smaller pieces. In an array, I split the problem up by breaking it into smaller contiguous subarrays. The smallest problem that I'm gonna solve here is an array of size one because that array is sorted. How do I put things back together? I put them back together here using my merge function. So that's how I combine the results from my recursive steps. All right, so let's talk about how to do recursive merge sort, because I can actually provide a recursive implementation. We're, we're not gonna do this in class. We're gonna let you do this on a homework problem. Uh, but I can, I can create, I mean, this is the right way in many ways to do merge sort. I write a merge function, that's sort of my helper function, and then I recursively apply it. So what's the base case here? I've reached an array with one element. I'm done. At that point, I don't split it down any farther, I can't. And I don't have to do any work. The, that array is sorted. What's my recursive step? I split the array into roughly two equal parts. Again, if it's odd size, I might get, you know, one that's a little bit bigger than the other, but that's okay. I roughly want to split the array into two pieces. How do I combine the results together? I call merge. So I take the big array, split it into smaller and smaller pieces, and then as I'm returning, I'm taking the results of you know, those smaller and smaller problems, and I'm merging them together using my merge function. Okay, so again, I'm not going to do this. I, I will, I did provide code here for the merge function, but we're gonna just skip over this. We'll come back, maybe we'll come back later at the end of class if we have time. But for now, I'm gonna leave this as an exercise to the reader. Because the hard thing about merge sort is not the recursive step, it's the merge, which is just sort of gross. That we already did last time, and that code is there for you. So once you have that, putting things back together is pretty, pretty simple. Okay. So let's think about the runtime of this algorithm. Um, so let's say we have an array of size eight. How many steps is it gonna take to complete this algorithm? So my first merge is, so let's think about once we've finished breaking the problem down into smaller and smaller subproblems, I have eight subproblems of size one. So my first merge is eight arrays of size one into four arrays of size two. What's the time complexity of this step? I have four merges to do. Each merge is combining two one-element arrays. So overall, this step takes one. Assume that each, assume that the, the each merge is O n and the, the length of the, the combined arrays, the result. So how many time steps do I need here? Four, but each one's doing two units of work, so it's like eight units of work, right? Four merges, each producing an array of size two, eight units of work here, okay? So essentially four O n merges where n is two. Okay, now we're continuing to combine our results as we go back up the tree. What about our next merge? So now I've got four arrays of size two into two arrays of size four. So I've got two O-N merges where N is four. Okay, stay with me. So roughly eight time units here as well. Eight time units in the first step, eight time units in the second step. You can see a pattern emerging here, so now I'm almost done. I've got two arrays of size four that I'm knitting back together into one array of size eight. So I've got one O-N merge where N is eight. So eight units of work here. So eight units of work in merge number one, eight units of work in merge number two, eight units of work in merge number three. So for merge sort, how much work am I doing in each merge? The number of merges that I'm doing is changing, but as that happens, the results are getting larger and larger, and so each merge in my merge sort algorithm takes what? Here I started with an array of size eight, but if I gave you an array with n elements, you would tell me that every merge step in merge sort takes O-N. 
So I've got on here, four on merges where n is two, on here, two on merges where n is four, on here. The n that I started with was eight. So essentially every step is doing, you know, different numbers of merges, but again, as the number of merges drops, the size of the results grows, and those two things cancel each other out. So essentially, I have O n merges at every step. How many steps did it take here? So I broke things down. I mean, you guys can count, right? How many merges did I have to, how many merge steps did I have to complete in order to put everything back together? Three. Okay? So that's interesting. Is that O n? Is that O n over two? Is that O n, I mean, it's not O n squared. N here is eight. It's not quite O n over two. Huh, okay. Let's look at this again. Yeah, so th it's three. So what is three? Three is log base two of eight. And you think about it, if I had a uh, array of size 16, how many more steps would I have to do? One. Right? I'd push all this down, I'd have one final merge to take my two arrays of size eight and put them back into in a single array of size 16. What if I had an array of size 32, how many steps would it take? Five. I've got four steps to merge things into arrays of size 16, one more step to merge them together into an array of size 32. What about 64? Six. So we see a pattern emerging, right? These are powers of two. 128 would be seven, 256 would be eight, et cetera. So the, the, the number of levels in my merge is growing as the base two logarithm of the number of elements in the array. So that's really nice. The number of, amount of work I have to do at every step is always O n. But the number of steps is growing as log n. So I combine those two together, I have n amount of work, log n steps, I, I finish with an O n log n algorithm. And remember last time, this is what we wanted, because you can prove, theoretically, that sorting, a, a good sorting algorithm in the worst case should do no worse than O n log n. Questions about this? Before we go on. So, you know, we've, we've looked at code that does O-N. We've looked at code that does O-N squared, and you've seen some of the characteristic features of those complexity classes. An O-N algorithm touches every piece of data in the array. You'll notice that in every step of my merge, I'm touching every piece of data in the array. I'm touching it at different steps. You know, there are four, four merges on the smaller arrays and then two and then one, but I'm still, every time, Every one of these levels is looking at every element in the array. I've looked at O-N squared stuff when I've seen, you know, nested loops. For example, when I'm comparing one element of the array against every other element. Now I have an O-N squared algorithm. Where log N comes into our algorithm analysis is typically when we're breaking the problem into smaller pieces, and those pieces are roughly about half the size, or a third or a quarter, but half is more common. So here I took a big problem, and I break it down into smaller and smaller pieces that are roughly half the size at each step. The number of levels that I end up with is log base two n. And so in this case, I've got log base two n levels, I've got n amount of work per level, I've got an O n log n algorithm. Another way to look at it here, um, you know, so, for example, again, here's the elements in the array, and I'm just showing how they get merged at every step. So here's my original array. Now I've got four sorted arrays of size two. I've got two sorted arrays of size four. And finally, when I'm done, I've got one big sorted array. And I could keep, I could keep going. Again, if I wanted to do 16, I'd push this up a level. If I wanted to do 128, I'd push it up a couple more levels. If I want to do values in between, then I'm sort of, you know, I stop getting these nice divisions. Not every, not every array is going to break evenly, but the, the analysis is still roughly the same. I'll stop here and just make sure I take any questions. This is not entirely non-subtle. Okay, maybe this makes a lot of sense. That's fantastic. Okay. So, we're done with merge sort. Let's talk about how it performs. So. Measure, let's think about time. This is the nice thing about merge sort. There's nowhere in this algorithm where there's any dependence on the inputs. 
So best case, worst case, average case for merge sort are identical. Does not matter. The number of levels is entirely determined by the number of, of elements in the array, and the merge step that I'm performing in every level is entirely constant in terms of, uh, in terms of n, the number of elements in the array. So there is no worst case, best case array for a merge sort. It is consistency embodied, you know, embodied. It will always perform identically. What about space? So here's where maybe as we move forward, we might think that we can make a little bit of an improvement. So at every, so let's go back and look at our, uh, not this one, all the way back here. Yeah, so at every level of this algorithm, essentially I need roughly O n space for these temporary arrays that my merge is filling. And so I essentially when I'm merging, I'm taking those two arrays and I'm writing, I'm copying their values into a temporary array. And so at every step of the algorithm, I need essentially O n space. It's not all in one place, but it's divided between all the different merge steps. And so there's where I think I might be able to make an improvement. So again, merge sort, fantastic performance. It achieves the best case performance for a sorting algorithm. And I just want to be careful because you, you'll read about sorting algorithms that will, will achieve O n or closer to O n under certain conditions. But the idea is that, you know, if you're an adversary and you pick the worst possible array and give it to it, it should, uh, a good sorting algorithm should never do worse than O n log n. Now again, one of the reasons why we don't use merge sort in practice is it also never does better than n log n. And so algorithms like Tim sort can, can do very close to O n under certain conditions that are frequently encountered in real data sets. Merge sort, you know, it doesn't matter. You give it the worst possible case, it does n log n. You give it the best possible case, it does n log n. It also requires a large amount of temporary space for all of these merges. So these are, uh, both things that more sophisticated sorting algorithms will improve on. Yeah, so, okay. So what we've been looking at, I just want to pause and, you know, point out a connection with a piece of terminology you may have, may have heard, right? So what we've been looking at are a couple of examples of what's referred to as a divide and conquer algorithm. So we've been talking about using recursion to break, you know, using a recursive algorithm or using a recursive programming technique in a way that breaks the problem down into smaller pieces. Once we get a piece that's small enough, it's easy to solve. Another name for this approach is divide and conquer. Take the big problem, split it into smaller pieces, take those smaller problems, make, break them into even smaller pieces, and eventually you have a problem that's small enough to solve in a way that you want to solve. And that can mean that it's trivial, in the cases where we've seen a one element array is already sorted, it can also sometimes mean, you know, when I'm trying to distribute uh, work across a data center that has 10,000 machines in it, the, the piece of the problem that I've given to a particular machine is small enough for it to solve efficiently. So it doesn't always mean that I have to break the problem down into these tiny, tiny pieces, but it means that my approach to a big problem is to try to figure out a way to cut it into smaller pieces that I can solve separately, and then combine the solution back together. Okay. Questions about merge sort before we go on. Okay, so last sorting algorithm we're going to talk about, and this is a fun one. Um, you know, again, quick sort is not a sorting algorithm that I think that's in wide use, uh, mainly because some of the problems it has that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but it's an interesting improvement on merge sort and it's a fun one to analyze because it has some really interesting behavior. Okay. So, merge sort's great. O n log n, that's as good as we can do. But it consumes a lot of space. I have all these temporary arrays that I have to keep creating every time I need to merge two of the smaller arrays together. So what if we can find a way around that problem? So this is what quicksort is able to do. So let me show you how quicksort works. In every step of my quicksort algorithm, I pick a special value called the pivot. How I choose the pivot value turns out to be an important component of how quicksort performs. But for now, I assume that I pick, like, the first value as my pivot. And then what I do is I split the array around the pivot. 
I move values that are smaller than the pivot to one side of it, and I move values that are bigger than the pivot to the other side of it. I have not sorted the array at that point. I just want to make that clear. I've only, you know, I've only essentially created two new parts of the array, the parts that are bigger than the pivot and the parts that are smaller than the pivot. So when I'm done, the pivot value is in the right spot, but the rest of the array is still unsorted. So how do I turn this into a sorting algorithm? Well, what do I have now? I have two smaller unsorted arrays. And so I repeat the process. I take each one of those smaller unsorted arrays, I pick a pivot value, and again, I adjust the array so that values that are smaller than the pivot are on one side, values that are bigger are on the other, and I keep doing this. And then I take e each one of those smaller arrays I've created, and I keep running my pivot sort algorithm until I get to an array of size one, which, again, is sorted by construction. All right, this is one where we really need to see a picture. So let's look at how this, how this would work. I've got several different diagrams here, so don't freak out if this one doesn't make sense immediately. So let's say I choose eight as my pivot value. Here's what the array looks like after I do my first pass. So I've moved all of the values that are smaller than the pivot to the left side, and all the values that are larger to the right. You'll notice a couple things here. This is important. The pivot is not in the middle. Sometimes the pivot is the biggest item. Sometimes the pivot is the smallest item. I don't know when I pick the pivot value where it's going to end up. And this is one of the things about quicksort that can get us into trouble. But the, but there's, there's two things that are, a couple things that are true now. The first thing is that the pivot value is in the right spot. The second thing is that I've got two smaller problems. I have an array of values that are bigger than the pivot that are still unsorted. In this case, that array is of size one, so I'm essentially done, but that doesn't always happen. And then I've got an array of values that are smaller than the pivot that are also unsorted. So again, I didn't sort this part of the array yet. I only moved those values to the left side of the pivot. Okay, so now I've got, I'm solving two problems in parallel. I've got the small subproblem on the right over here, and I've got the larger subproblem on the left. And I'm going to apply the same algorithm. So I pick a pivot value. Here, what I'm doing is I'm picking a pivot that's the first element in the array. And again, this is an important part of how quicksort works, and we'll come back and talk about how it affects its performance in a few minutes. I pick two new pivot values, and now I rerun the algorithm. On the right side, again, I'm really finished here. I don't really have to do any more work. I've got an array of size one. But on the left, my pivot has, again, divided the array into two parts. I've got values that are larger than five over here, values that are smaller than five on the left side. Here, I've done a little bit of a better job in picking a pivot in that I've roughly divided the array. I had six values when I started. Now I've got two subarrays, one of size three, one of size two. Note that every step, the pivot value, again, ends up in the right place. So once I stick a pivot in, I don't have to move it. So at this point, eight is in the right spot, five is in the right spot, and 11 is in the right spot. The rest of the values in the array, I need to keep working on. And I just repeat this process. So now I'm done over here. I've got two smaller arrays that I need to sort on this side. I pick new pivot values. This one, at this point, is finished. This one turns out to be finished as well, but it didn't have to be. And now I'm done. So at each step, I take the array, I pick a pivot value, I divide the array into two parts, the values that are smaller than the pivot, the values that are larger than the pivot, I put the pivot in the right spot, and I've created two smaller subproblems. And then I recursively apply this algorithm until I'm done. All right, so let's look at this partition step in more detail. So partition and merge in quicksort is sort of like merge and merge sort. It's really where all the work happens. Once you have your partition function, the rest just works. Okay, so let's look at how to partition. Let's say I'm going to pick six as my pivot value. And this is tricky. This is one of those times of the year where I practice, because this is a hard algorithm to get right. All right, so, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick my pivot value. In this case, again, I'm going to pick the first value in the array. But I could pick the last. I could pick what at random. It really doesn't matter. 
I also am tracking where the smallest element, or, or where the, the pivot should go, essentially. Where should the pivot go in the array? That's the thing I want to keep track of. When I see a smaller value, I'm gonna move the pivot position forward, because I know that the pivot should go to the right of that value. And I'm gonna move that value into the smaller section. So we'll see how this works here. So, okay, so let's start here. Is five smaller than six? Five is smaller than six. In this case, I end up swapping five with itself, and so nothing really happens. Is six, seven smaller than six? No. And so here, I'm not gonna increase the size of the smaller part. I'm gonna keep going. Is three smaller than six? It is. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swap three with seven. So let's see, when I'm done, here's how this looks, and I increase the size of the part of the array that's smaller than the pivot value. I found a smaller value, I need to move it into the smaller section, so I swap it with seven, and I keep going. Now I've got four, four is also smaller than the pivot value, so I'm gonna swap it with the current location and increase the pivot value. 11, 11 is larger than the pivot value, so I keep going, I don't change anything. Eight is also larger than the pivot value. Again, I keep going, don't change anything. Get to negative one, negative one is smaller than the pivot value. So now I'm gonna swap it with seven and increase, you know, bump the, the pivot counter forward. So now I'm done. I have values over here that are larger than the pivot. I have values over here that are smaller than the pivot. The last thing I need to do is put the pivot into place. If I'm gonna do that is, in this case, I'm gonna swap it with negative one. This is a, this is a tricky, tricky algorithm. Questions about this? Let's go over this again. Let's walk through it one more time. All right. I pick six as my pivot. I keep track of that. Where are, where's the break point between the values that are smaller than the pivot and the values that are larger than the pivot? Here, five is smaller than the pivot, but again, what it turns out is that I end up swapping five with itself. So five ends up in the same spot. I make the, the part of the array that's smaller than the pivot larger. Here, I find a value that's larger than the pivot, and so I don't do anything. I just keep going. I find a value that's smaller than the pivot. I need to move it into the smaller section and increase the smaller section by one. So I do this by swapping it with seven and bumping the pivot counter. I have found another value that's smaller than the pivot. So again, I need to move it into the smaller part of the array and increase the size of the smaller part of the array. So in this case, I swap it with seven and bump my pivot counter forward. Now I found 11, 11 is larger than the pivot. I can keep going. Eight is also larger than the pivot. I can keep going. Negative one is smaller than the pivot, so same thing. I'm going to swap it so it ends up in the smaller part of the array, and I'm gonna increase the smaller part of the array by one. Now I'm done. I know that there's a break point here between the values that are larger than the pivot, values that are smaller than the pivot. I also know where the pivot should go. On this diagram, the pivot actually goes one position to the left of where the pointer is. I swap it with negative one, and I'm finished. Jeremy, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, what's the arrow? Yeah, the arrow in this is sort of one, one past, right, where the, where the pivot should go. All right. Should we take a stab at this? Let's try it, okay. So, I've got my input array, and in this case, I've got both a start and an end position. And this example needs a little bit of fixing. I apologize, I pushed some changes to this right before we started. So let's do this, and then when I'm done, I'm gonna print the test array. Let's just make sure this runs. Okay, so that's my original array. So this partition function is essentially asking me to partition a particular section of the array from start to end. In this case, we'll just have it do the entire array from position zero to the length. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab my pivot value. And here I'm gonna choose the first value in the array. 
when, for qu there are some, qu again, we're gonna talk about this in a second, there's some quicksort algorithms that will not choose the first value as a pivot because there are some good reasons not to. If I don't choose the first value as a pivot, what I can do is before I start the algorithm, just whatever value I choose, swap it so it's the first value in the array and then continue this approach, right? So it's easy to make anything the first value in the array. Okay, and then I'm also gonna keep track of my pivot position, which I'm gonna set to be start. So I'm gonna go through the rest of the array. I'm starting with the next element past the pivot. Okay, so if I see a value, I say if input array i is less than my pivot value, then I have work to do. I'm gonna bump my pivot position, and then I create a temporary variable up here. I'm gonna say input array pivot position is equal to input array. Essentially what I'm doing here is I'm swapping the values of input array pivot position and input array i. So I'm swapping that small value into the smaller part of the array, increasing the size. When I'm done, I have a little bit more work to do. I have to need to put the pivot in the right spot. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say input array pivot position is equal to, sorry, input array. I'm gonna use my temporary variable here again. Um, put array pivot position. I'm gonna set the uh, place where the pivot goes to the pivot value, and then I'm gonna set the first element, which is where my, which is where the pivot was, to whatever the, the temporary variable. I know this makes even more sense when you implement it. Okay, shall we see if it works? Ho oh, ho, look at that. All the practice paid off. So, let's, let's, I mean, let's at least make sure this is correct. So here's my pivot, eight. Are the values that are greater than the pivot to the right? Yes, there was just one of them. Are the values that are less than the pivot to the left? Yes. Let's try some other, <laughs> I should just quit while I'm ahead, but let's try some other, uh, Let's try some other arrays. Let's try a, a two element array. Okay, that's good. This has to be able to sort a two element array. If it doesn't, I'm in trouble. Um, let's try a, uh, let's try an array where the pivot should go all the way to the right. Make sure that works, it does. Let's try an array where the pivot should stay put. Let's make sure that works, it does. Okay, so I think this is correct. This is one of those things that I would encourage you, you know, you know draw some pictures, look at the slides, go through, it's, it's subtle. One, one way to think about it is kind of the, as the pivot moves to the right, you're sort of pushing values that are larger than it to the right. And you're pulling values that are smaller than it to the left. One thing that this relies on is the ability to move elements around within the smaller part and the larger part. Since when I do that swap, what's happening is I'm taking a larger value and I'm moving it closer to the end of the array so that I can take a smaller value that should be in the smaller portion and put it there. Okay. So. So now let's think about runtime. So one thing that's interesting here. Sorry, let me go back because this is important. How much? So what's the runtime of my pivot step? Assuming that I'm operating on an array of size n. Yeah. It's O n. Yeah, I'm basically going all the way through from one end to the other. I'm looking at every value, so this is an O n algorithm. How much space does it use? So when I did a merge, I created an array that was the same size as the arrays I was working on. How much extra space does this consume? Well, I've got like a couple of temporary variables here. Yeah, smaller. Not very much, actually. So this is roughly a constant amount of extra space, extra memory that I have to consume to run this algorithm. It is not O n. And that's what I wanted out of quicksort. One of the problems with merge sort, too much space, too much memory. If I run on a huge data set, I need essentially twice the amount of memory that it takes to store that data set. 
quick sort, constant amount of extra space. So that's really nice. That's a good feature of it. However, there are trouble lurking here. So now let's think about analyzing the runtime performance of quicksort. Let's consider an array of size eight. So in the best case, we pick pivot values that divide the array evenly at every step. And so at that point, the analysis is similar to merge sort. It's not quite identical because quicksort takes a value out of the array every time, and so the things are, the things don't work as beautifully. But, but anyway, let's just pretend. Um, so essentially, imagine that in the step one, I partition the array into two arrays that are roughly size four. I know one would be three and one would be four, and the, the quick, the pivot is in there too, but, but let's just ignore that for now. It doesn't really affect the analysis. Partition two, now I've got two arrays of size four, then I'm gonna split down into arrays of size two, and then finally I've got four splits of size two down into size one. And as soon as I've partitioned the array into pieces that are a size one, I'm done. I have no more work to do. Now, of course, the interesting thing, it's a sort of fun um, comparison between merge sort and quick sort. Merge sort splits the array as it goes down and then merges it as it goes back. Quick sort does all the work on the way down. So quick sort does the partition and then it restarts the algorithm on each smaller piece, does the partition again. And so by the time quick sort gets to the bottom, by the time quicksort has divided everything together, it's done. It divided everything apart, excuse me, it's finished. So merge sort, I divide into smaller pieces so that I can put them back together. Quicksort, I do more work when I divide into smaller pieces because as soon as I get to pieces that are size one, I'm finished. I've, I've sorted the array. I'm sorting on the way down, not on the way up. Okay. Here's the problem, though. So. In the best case, I picked a pivot value that evenly divides the array. So this is a huge caveat about quicksort. This bold part right here. In the best case, the pivot evenly divides the array at every step. What if it doesn't? Hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna run into some issues here. Okay. So let's consider an array of size eight. Let's imagine that by chance, the pivot that I choose in every step is the maximum or the minimum in the array. So my first partition, I break the array into two arrays. One is size seven, the other is size one. Uh-oh. In my second partition, I divide the array of size seven into two smaller arrays. One is size one, the other is size six. In my third partition, I divide the array of size six into two small arrays, one of size one, the other of size five. And this keeps going and going. I'm o how much smaller am I making the problem at every step? One. You can think about it this way. Remember, the partition is always, always ends up in the right place. So if it's the maximum or minimum value, there's one element that's moved into the right place and the rest of the array is still unsorted. So I'm only chipping away at the problem. Rather than taking it and ripping it into two big pieces so that it gets smaller and smaller as we go, I'm only chipping off little tiny bits. So in the worst case, I have n steps and every partition is O n. So in the worst case, I go from being O n log n, where I had this beautiful logarithmic behavior that I got because I was splitting the problem into smaller and smaller pieces that were roughly the same size. Now, I've got n steps, each with n, and so I've got O n squared. So essentially, I might as well have, be running insertion sort at this point. So again, let's look at how this works. So I pick a pivot. Let's say the pivot is the max. Pick a pivot, pivot is the max, pick a pivot, pivot is the max, pick a pivot, pivot is the max. You can see how this is working. This is essentially insertion sort, right? Okay. So now, you know, this is one of those things where it's like, oh, I have this cool thing that seems to work and now it's got a problem, so what do I do? Well, now I'm gonna zero in on what that problem is. 
The problem here is created by choosing bad pivots. So how do I avoid that? Well, there are some problems with the obvious choices. This is important to note. So if I pick the first value, you might have noticed something about this array when I started. Right? This array is sorted in reverse order. And if I knew that, it's O-N to reverse it. Reversing an array is O-N. So the best case runtime for this array should be O-N. If I can detect that it's sorted, but it's sorted backwards. If it's sorted in descending order, what I wanted is ascending, it's O-N. If it's sorted in, you know, ascending order, what I wanted is descending, it's O-N. Just to flip around. So if I had been able to detect that, I could have done O-N instead, because quicksort is choosing a dumb pivot value, I'm gonna end up with O-N squared. Remember, these are huge differences. Remember those curves? One goes up like this, the other is down there. Particularly when I start to look at large data sets. So this is bad. This is, you know, sometimes something we refer to when we talk about algorithms as pathological behavior. And it's on a common case. It's not uncommon to have data that's sorted. Maybe one part of your program sorted it in, you know, descending order, and now you want to flip it around. That's not an uncommon problem. So we don't want this type of terrible pathological performance for a fairly common case. All right, so first value fails if the array is sorted in reverse order. Last value is even worse, because it fails if the array is already sorted. And again, that's not an uncommon case. It's not uncommon to have sorted data and to be sorting it again, because you didn't realize that another part of the program sorted it for you, and you're just making sure. Or you added one value somewhere, and most of the array is sorted, but you just need to do a little work to make sure that value gets into the right spot. So that doesn't work either. I can choose a random value. That works better sometimes. The other thing that some uh, quick sort implementations will do is they'll take three values. Let's say I take the first three, and I pick the median. Or say I pick three at random, and then I pick the median as the pivot. So essentially, I'm sampling. What's, what's the problem with this step of my algorithm, though? It seems like I could do a lot better. So let me, okay, look. I mean, I understand that people thought about these problems a lot, but I'm pretty smart, right? So here's what I think we should do. I think we should choose the median value from the array. It's the perfect pivot, right? If I choose the median, then half the values are gonna be on one side, half are gonna be on the other. That makes sense, right? So why don't I do that? I f I'm, I'm on the verge of a breakthrough here. This is gonna be Jeff sort, right? The next cool sorting algorithm. Just do quick sort, choose the median. Why, why can't I do that? Eh? No, the median has to be in the array. I have to sort the array to compute the median. Yeah, how am I gonna compute the median? I've gotta sort the array. Once I've sorted the array, I've solved the problem. Right? So yes, I would very much encourage you to try this, right? Sort the array and then choose the median and then run quick sort, right? It's too late, right? Well, how did you, so you've created a recursive problem, right? In order to solve my, in order to get quick sort to work, I have to be able to sort the array, right? If that's how your sorting algorithm works, you're in trouble, yeah. Yeah, I can't choose the median, right? This is why I'm doing these sort of weird things, right? I can compute the median of three values pretty efficiently, right? But once I need to compute the median of a large data set, I have to sort it. And so I've already solved the problem. Okay. So, we've got our scoreboard here. Let's look at quick sort in terms of its overall performance. Time, I'm gonna say best case is O n log n. And again, this is another case where, like merge sort, in the best case, quick sort still can't do better than n log n. And that's one of the goals of a lot of practical sorting algorithms. Best case should be close to O n. Here, best case is O n log n. Worst case is O n squared. And so this is what frightens us about quicksort, is that it might seem to be working great. I'm getting a lot of memory savings compared to merge sort, but there's these cases lurking that can produce extremely pathological performance, particularly with naive implementations. Average case, we're gonna say O n log n for algorithms that do a decent job of picking a good pivot value. Okay? Space, 
Now here it depends on how many pivots I, how many steps I have to do. Um, but worst case for quicksort is on, best case is o log n, right? Um, and that's because of how many levels I'm gonna have running at the same time. So the, the space overhead, there's a constant amount of space per level. And if I have O log n levels, then I have roughly log n space. In the worst case, where essentially I'm doing insertion sort, every one of those levels has a little bit of overhead. Yeah? Why do they call it quick sort if it's not faster than more sort? I don't know. It's, it's a good name, right? I mean, if you're picking names from a branding perspective, like quick sort, you guys should invent fast sort and rapid sort, speedy sort, uh, super quick sort, actually quick sort. Um, yeah, yeah, Jeremy. Why is it um, considered um, log n? Because every time you go through it, it just keeps on. So it doesn't, like, so temperature is only, um, Right, so that's constant, but you need them for every level as I go down. Yeah, that's a great, let's, let's, that's a good discussion for the forum. It'd be easier to explain offline. Yeah. But definitely better than merge sort as far as space. Okay. All right. So, let's look at a couple of different features of these sorting algorithms now that we've seen all of them. Um, one of them is input dependence. So, the best case for insertion sort is already sorted, the worst case was it was sorted backwards. And again, these are for the implementations that we've discussed. For every one of these algorithms, there's like 60 different ways that you can implement it. Uh, but these are for the variants we've looked at. Merge sort doesn't matter. Again, best worst case, same. That's nice, on some level. Again, I mean, consistency is something that you might like out of your algorithm. You know, you, you know that it's predictable, you know exactly how long it's gonna take. Quick sort, for our implementation that chooses the pivot is the first value, which is dumb, best case performance is on random data, because that means that I'm likely to get a value that's in the middle of the array. Worst case is sorting in one order or the other, depending on how you implement it. All right, so now we've got, every, we can put everything up on the big board. These are all the algorithms we've talked about. Best case for insertion sort, is on. So insertion sort is one of these algorithms that actually does very well on already sorted data, and that's a nice feature of it. Worst case, on squared. That's the problem with it. Um, average case, also on squared. For randomly distributed data, uh, insertion sort's gonna get you on squared. Merge sort. Best case, on log n. Worst case, on log n. Average case, on log n. It is the steady one in the bunch. Quick sort, best case, O n log n. Worst case, O n squared. Average case, we're gonna be charitable and say O n log n. Space overheads are better here. Space, insertion sort was O one, I just need that temporary variable. Merge sort, O n, I need a whole separate array to merge things into. And quick sort, O n log n, due to the recursion involved. And the space that I needed over step. Okay. So I'm just gonna stop here since I'm out of time and, and we can discuss some of these trade-offs on the forum. Let me quickly, as you guys are packing up, talk about this week's lab. So lab this week is going to be um, your first taste of getting started on your final project. I wanted to do this this week so you guys have some time to think about it before break. So in this lab this week, you're gonna be finding a partner, coming up with an idea of an app you're gonna build. We'll have some UI design uh, for you guys to do for practice, and we'll start showing you a little bit about web interfaces and JSON. As a reminder, there is no class on Wednesday. We will not be here on Wednesday, enjoy the day off. On Friday, I'm gonna give a fun lecture about the internet and web interfaces that will also be super useful for you on your final project. MP5 early deadline is today, please get going. I have my usual office hours at 10. I'll be 10 minutes late because I have to move my car. I will see you guys on Friday.